Welcome to part three of this series on boat maintenance, which is mainly focused on rig servicing. Previously, in part two, I had finished dismantling all the three furling motor drives, did some carpet cleaning, pulled the top, then the bottom off the mast to extract the in-mast furling system, and received our new set of EPEC sails from Elstrom. In part three, I continue servicing the mast, dismantle all the spreaders, then finally start the winterization process, which I originally came out to the boat to do. It's hard to believe, but I'm running out of outside jobs to do, and I've just got another couple of days of this beautiful weather. So I'm going to take the uh, kicker and gooseneck fitting off to try to renew the plastic underneath. It's, again, it's like a, a once-time opportunity to do it. The question is, how will the bolts come out? Okay, what is it? Oh my goodness, that was easy. Oof. Look at that. And that's with plastic underneath it. It's just the pure water getting trapped underneath there. Time for a clean. Let's see if we have the same luck with the gooseneck. So we've got all the bolts out, apart from two. One here, and one here. And I've put heat on them, and goodness knows what, and they just will not come. They even broke my bit in this one. So I'm going to have to think about what to do with that one. Meanwhile, this one's come off, as you saw. This side is cleaned up. You can see the corrosion, even though the plastic was there. And this side is just as I took it off. Quite a difference, huh? Yesterday I was trying to film servicing these winches but somebody had a compressor going and it was just too noisy so we've got two on this side a 46 and an 8 and then two on this side two 46s so I've just put all the tops on the three cylinders making sure that the springs are working properly the bearings are laid out now it's just a matter of putting them all back on greasing them nice and shiny two inches on this side and nice and shiny two inches on this side more importantly they sound beautiful not a job I enjoy a job that needs to be done Yesterday, I finally got this uh, gooseneck fitting off the boom. I had to drill the head off of this bolt, so I've got to drill that one out, but now I've just got to clean it up. It looks pretty dramatic when you scrape this white powder off, but actually underneath, although the anodizing is gone, it's still pretty solid. These holes I'll have to drill out because they are completely caked in the stuff. So hopefully if we get this off, clean it up, put some lano coat underneath, and a new plastic protecting sheet and it will last another 10 years. This is my ideal paint scraper. Just a knife on the side, slightly bending the blade in. Ruins the blade, but the blades are cheap. It's the same way I trim down the um, Sikaflex on the teak decks when they start standing out. When I come back, I'll be putting some primer on this, but I don't want to put primer on just yet because I haven't got the right primer. The trick with aluminium and alloy is you've got to get the primer on the second the oxidation's on. So I've done that and oxidation starting immediately. So the trick is, is to put primer on with a um, Brillo pad and actually get rid of the corrosion at the same time as you put the primer on. So. That's going to be a bit of an exercise. I'm going to do that when I come back. Just for now, I'm just going to clean it up. So before I attempt to undo these two bolts, I've got the blowtorch inside. I have my dentist mirror. And I am doing some dental work. Make sure I point the heat gun 
in the right place and not my face preferably I feel here it's getting hot yeah. okay let's give it a go it probably won't come out ready oh look at that beauty is will the backing plate fall off okay got it yeah like it's got threaded inserts or rather it had threaded inserts I guess I'll have to be replacing it. and there is the mystery bolt somehow I'm gonna have to drill the rest of that out maybe I should just lift the damn thing in there or buy a new one Anyway, I've got a few months to think about it. Now that I've got the bolts out, I'm just running a tap through to make sure we clear out all the corrosion inside the threads. A few things are cleared out and they just sail in now. As before, you couldn't do that with your fingers. Today I'm taking apart the Imarset dome. I want to sell it on eBay because it's uh, we've never used it. It's too expensive to to keep but I want to polish this top before I try and sell it because that's kind of a bit faded so I've taken that off then I removed all the electronic components from the base like most painted alloys this alloy base had suffered from corrosion the base is now here on its own so we will take it somewhere to have a quick sandblast, prime it and get it looking a little bit more presentable. I don't think I'd buy that right now. Okay, so I've got the spreaders apart. These end fittings. There's one that's not been cleaned up. And there's one that's been cleaned up, so they clean up really nicely. It's very easy to tell which is the inboard end and which is the outboard end of these spreaders. This one's not too bad on the outboard end. The inboard end is highly corroded. And I asked them if they could just sell me some extrusion like this. I mean, they probably do it in 20 meter lengths. But they said, no, 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 no. We can't sell you the extrusion, but we can make you have a set of spreaders. Surprise, surprise. At $20,000 three sets of spreaders. Are you kidding me? I've got the top set of spreaders apart. I've cleaned and polished all the fittings, including the antenna fitting. And on the inside, I managed to clean it up quite well so that these now fit very snugly in here, like that. So we'll rivet those back in and I'll seal around the end. And I've added two little holes here for water to drain out this time. This, on the other hand, is where the idiot electrician put three anchor points for the cable. Look at the corrosion it's caused. I mean, this must be four or five millimeters deep. It's so annoying. So annoying. You see where Selden do it with their proper teff gel and then the electrician comes along bugs it all up by doing that. I can throttle them. Today is microsurgery day. We have the MRSAT uh, handset. We have one very tired cable where all the outer layer broke. We have one new damned expensive cable to replace it with and I am going to do the surgery under a microscope to replace it. One trick the screws, which actually my father taught me, when you're putting them back in, unscrew them first and you get until you get that little click that says it's just gone past the thread. As soon as you get that little click then screw them up. That way you're guaranteed not to cross thread, especially when you're going into soft things like plastic. There we are, that's the lead back on. Nice. Hmm, might even keep it. The plan is to sell it on eBay, but it actually looks quite nice. Airtime is just ridiculously expensive. Elton Musk should sort all this out, hopefully, with his star system. 
these inline set systems will be either become useless or they'll have to drastically reduce their airtime to be competitive. Very nice. Look at that. Nice new flex. See the difference? One all cracked. One nicely new. Beautiful. Having fixed the handset, it's now time to reinstall the antenna and electronics into the base of the antenna, which I have cleaned and painted. Looking good. And get antenna dome back all in working order again. This may look a bit daunting, but having taken a few snapshots while dismantling, it all went back together just fine. So that's all the electronics cards back in the base and no screws spare. Nothing loose, thank goodness. Hang on, two more things to do. These heat sink pads need to go onto here. Two motors sit on these. Drive the dish. And I guess they get quite hot, so they have to go into that heat sink there. Then we need to look at which way around this goes. I'm always remembering, I mustn't touch my fingers on any of the boards. It's actually quite a smart piece of engineering. Isn't it? And last but not least, on goes the dome. There we are, look at that. That looks pretty nice, huh? What do you think? And this is how it all came out. Someone got a real bargain on eBay. It had only ever made five phone calls. So having got infused, rebuilding the two uh, top spreaders today, I'm taking the uh, other spreaders apart, so I'm going to put up a time lapse so you can see me drilling out and getting them all apart. Let's hope these come apart a little bit easier than the other ones. There were lots of rivets to drill out. I think it's going to take over 200 new rivets to get all the three sets of spreaders back together again. As you can see, a fair bit of corrosion as it's coming out. Luckily, it's been sitting there in the rain, this one, and all the aluminum powder is wet. So they seem to be coming out quite easily compared to the last one, which were really brutal to get out. Anyway, that's the middle spreaders done. Now the lowers. This is certainly not routine maintenance. But sadly, I've noticed on several forums that many others have had the same problem with corrosion, and some of the rigs were only four years old. I tell you, you've got to be really determined to do a job like this. I certainly had to be in my JDI mode. JDI being short for, don't think about it, just do it. Okay, you get the idea. Now let's have a break from these damn spreaders. So it's time to move the cutlass bearing, which is inside the T-bracket. We had this um, little device made in Spain to try to put the damn thing out. It's a sleeve that goes inside and pushes it through. It's moving. So essentially, we are pulling this sleeve here, is pushing the uh, cutlass bearing out while it's being held back like this. Yeah, that's the bolts out. Now, will this come out? Oh, yeah. 
Yep. Pretty cool, huh? I like this device. Let's undo these. There's a couple of sleeves there. You cut this bearing. Scrape the label off the outside because that's always something that I tend to forget and then it won't go in. Put some grease on it. Go. Right. Okay, I'll put the camera around that side because I'm left-handed. Anyway, give you a different view. So I use the old cutlass to knock the new one in. But not least, hard to believe that that would actually fall out given it took me a huge amount of effort to push it in. We put these locking screws in, they lock against the cutlass bearing and stop it coming out in theory. There we go, done. Solid as a rock. Nothing on there at all, not a bit of movement as you'd expect with a new one. With 200 euros, job done. It's another beautiful day today, so today I'm cleaning up the spreaders. I've done all the fittings and I've soaked them in this thing called spotless stainless, which is pretty nasty stuff, but it hopefully will make these all nice and shiny. So I'm just about to clean those off with some water and then I'll take it to weaver to polish them. So. like a new piece. I don't even need to buff that really other than to put some polish on it. The beauty of this stainless steel cleaner is that you just have to paint it on then thoroughly wash it off with the fresh water. But I only use it on pieces like this that I can do in a controlled environment because it's pretty nasty stuff. You certainly don't want it getting anywhere near the deck or any gel coat. Look at those, lovely. We let that soak in there a little bit. I shall start on the ends of the spreaders. So that's what they look like to start with. And I'm gonna get them cleaned out. The best I can. It's almost impossible to get them perfect. Just gonna get this white corrosion off. See, look at that. I'm just back from Weaver's where I did some buffing. We now have a bucket full of nice shiny fittings. Look at that. Nice, huh? Just these tubes to the finish and we'll be in business for reconstructing them all. Don't quite think that's gonna happen this time because I don't think we're gonna have rivets in time, sadly. Cutting out these plastic sheets to go between the stainless steel end fittings on the spreaders and the aluminium is quite intricate. You need some gentle music, a very sharp knife, and a lot of patience. I'd like to say I gained these skills from a misused childhood, but actually I gained them from a very good childhood. It's what came of a kid whose parents wouldn't let them have TV. Okay, this piece is for the lower spreader end. Slightly tight fitting, it won't matter. It's 1 32nd thick. The spreader bar comes down onto there. So we cannot get any electrical contact between the stainless and the aluminium. Hopefully that will avoid the horrible corrosion we've been seeing. Tricky. Takes time. But that's two of those done. Two of the mid spreaders done. Now I've got to do all the end fittings. home straight for these spreaders. I always struggle to find something that would clean the dirt off the spreaders without leaving marks. At this point I will mute the sound which was too affected by wind noise. I've been looking for a method to clean light oxidation off of anodized aluminium such as the mast and spreaders etc. 
Here I'm using an aluminium polish along with a very fine grade Scotch Brite pad. But it should be noted this polish is meant for raw aluminium, not anodizing. But if I apply it as gently as possible, with just enough pressure to remove the oxidation but not scratch the anodized surface, it all works fine. I'd rather underdo it than overdo it because, of course, this Scotch Brite does, without a doubt, scratch. So we have to be very careful, just enough to get the brown stains off. And then wipe it clean by like any polish. And the polish contains PTFE, which ends up giving a thin protection layer. Well, I've done two pretty quickly, and we've got six more to go. Meanwhile, in East Coast's marine rigging workshop, I started riveting back together the upper set of spreaders. Well, that is, until I ran out of rivets. With the cold weather outside, I've decided to move into the engine room. I was going to flush these engines with antifreeze. This is the generator. But then I just noticed around this um, heat exchanger quite a lot of corrosion there like uh, there's some salt water escaping so you can have to see what's going on there before that gets too bad salt water spraying over any engine is not a good idea so first of all i've got to drain all the cooling fluid out of it the problem is is that the drain to drain the water out the engine is there obviously if i take that off all the water is just going to go into the bottom of the sump so I'm making myself, out of a milk container, a little funnel to get in there. Okay, so I cut a little hole in the end. Cut that piece out the handle, so we don't need this piece. Like that. Put some butyl tape around the end of my little funnel. Should put it over the socket. Hopefully squeeze it against the engine. Okay, so we have a container. I have a bit of pipe. I have my special jig. At that end I've got butyl tape and I've squashed it all the way around. So hopefully, particularly at the bottom, it will stay. Here we go. Ready? Oh, look at that! Isn't that sweet? Look at that. Not a drip coming down the engine. How stupid putting a drain plug right in there, huh? It's gurgling out quite nicely. We are close to getting full here. Still coming out. Got one gallon out. Had to put it in here. Much more than I thought, actually. Anyway, much better than getting all that lot in the bilge and all over the place. Well, that from a milk bottle worked pretty well. Reminds me of a shiwi. Not that I've ever seen one. I think I will pattern this as the shiwi for generator. How about that? Okay, I've got the heat exchanger out. I didn't have the camera on because I know you don't want to hear a grown adult crying or screaming or swearing. That was one end of the heat exchanger. Big rust pile, rust and salt pile. And that was the other end. Big rust and salt pile. So obviously we've got a leak on the heat exchanger. I hate the fact that we have to have salt water inside the generator. I'm not even thinking about mounting the heat exchanger outside somewhere where I can see it down here it's a real pain to get out. What do you call salt crystals that look like icicles? Salticles? Anyway, whatever. We had salticles in the bottom of the generator. Not good. Luckily, I had, last time I was in there, coated everything in grease. So once I wipe the salt off, uh, nothing's too damaged underneath. Thank goodness. And screw you, generator. I guess it's been a while since you've craved attention. So this is the generator heat exchanger after I've cleaned it up a bit. Yeah, I couldn't resist polishing it. Anyway, the idea was to fill it full of boiling water and see if I can feel where the leak is. I think it's this braised joint here that was leaking. Unless I can make it leak again, I really don't trust it. I don't want to buy a new one because it's probably damn expensive. It's a beautiful day today, so today I'm back outside and now I'm taking everything out of the boom. So look, it's an empty tunnel. Just one more left to come out here. These pulleys, it's completely jammed. So I'm having to drill them out. It just means I've got to rivet them back in again, but it's not a big deal. So this is the last one I've got to undo. Okay, there's the rivet head. 
heads all off. Inside we've got the other end of the rivets. So we're going to be doing a lot of re-riveting. There it is, we're absolutely solid. So now just to get some worse corrosion out of here. The key thing is, is to get it protected when we put it all back together. We're going to try to stop it getting any worse. At least you can't really undo the corrosion that's already there. You can stop future corrosion. Actually, this end, it gets all the salt. I'm thinking when I put it back, I'm going to put some sort of cover over it. I also just put this pulley in here. Behind it, I put plastic and lano coat before I riveted it in. The thing about these is, is that the water that runs down the side there cannot escape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill a little hole in front of it so the water can get out, okay. This is the outhaul hydraulic cylinder that I painted in the previous video. It's now all back together and ready to go back into the boom. First the shift carriage engages on the rail profile inside the top of the boom and the beast goes back in. Then each hanger engages on that same rail. I line them up. And lastly, the gooseneck end is latched onto the boom end fitting and pushed in those final few centimeters. Uh, voila! It's in. This morning, I'm in the engine room. Finally, winterizing. We have the antifreeze here in a bucket. I've got a small bilge pump. And because the heat exchanger is off the generator, the only thing I have to really pump water around, antifreeze, is round the cooling circuit that goes on the electrical end of the generator. So with my new 12 volt pump socket newly installed here, he says the pump starts and we have pink water going in and pink water going out. Generator is done, winterized. So now the main engine. I've got four gallons of antifreeze in here. This is the second lot we're putting through and you watch when I start this engine just how quickly this thing sucks. I tell you what, I've often thought that the motor should be used as a bilge pump somehow in an emergency. Just watch how this impeller drains this bucket. It is quite phenomenal. And that's just on tick over. Okay, here goes. You ready? That's it, pretty fast, huh? Can you imagine what it's like if you're revving it? You could drain any sinking boat if you had the valve set up, right? The only reason why I haven't done that is because there's a chance if you accidentally switch the valves that you could sink the boat, because obviously you need a raw end of the hose somewhere in the bilge to suck the water out. If you accidentally knock that valve, you'd actually fill the boat rather than sucking it out. Anyway, interesting idea, and that is the Endrin ready for winter, antifreeze done. Oh, and by the way, I put some fuel stabilizer in the fuel, so that should have sucked around there now as well. Next job, air conditioning. And hopefully, manage to keep this topped up as it sucks it through. Luckily, it's not as fast as the Volvo. And I've got the watch over there. Pink water coming out. See the water coming through. Luckily it's a clear hose, so we take quite a lot of this because the piping is a long way up into the saloon. Hope I can switch between one bottle to the other fast enough. Okay, we've got pink water coming through. That's good. Wouldn't like to have to do this every year, that's sure. What a faff. You've either got to take your mask down and get to a nice warm shed and pay someone big bucks or you've got to winterize everything and this one I'm just going to pour enough to go down this hose so this is the deck wash pump 
I've got the impeller out of it at the moment, so can't suck anything through. It's Sunday, I'm leaving on Wednesday, so I just want to spend time just to secure everything up and this morning's little task is just to make sure the boom, which with the piston inside, needs to be upright. Uh, I don't want it falling over, so I'm just going to secure something like this. So I'm going to put on time lapse and we'll see how long it takes. And this is the end of this series of maintenance videos. I plan to return to Cloudy Bay again in April and do all the rebuilding the rig and systems after gathering the parts and knowledge over the winter. That work will no doubt yield another short series of videos on rig rebuild. Plus at the same time I have a few other interesting projects to accomplish. Till then, the trophy corner is now full of shiny items ready and waiting for me in springtime. And Cloudy Bay is all snug with a winter coat on and Daddy Ray is on hand to keep an eye on her. So see you in the spring. Thanks for watching.